Okay, what I want you to do is close your eyes and imagine yourself walking into a recording studio. I'm willing to bet for the majority of you that thing that you see first is a majestic console in the center of the room. That truly is the classic image of a recording studio. Now I want you to snap back to the present and realize that this is an amazing time in history to be making music. I mean, gear and software is just so accessible and all the great vintage gear has been emulated in plug-in form available for all of us to you know, use on our computers. Even some of the top mixing engineers in the world are all in the box. But no matter what era you're from, I think good mixing comes from a finely tuned relationship between your ears and your fingers. And I think that's something that's getting lost in modern day mixing practices. And that's something I want to discuss today. If you want to get your hands on the mix, then join me for this episode of I Don't Have a Band, right now. Hey there, I'm Dan, the self-proclaimed Lonely Rocker. Welcome to this episode of I Don't Have a Band. This is the series devoted to the home studio enthusiast and the home recording musician with videos to hopefully help make your home studio life better. So thank you for joining me. So today I want to take a look at DAW controllers. I've got the Icon Pro Audio Qcom Pro G2 here in my studio with an EX G2. I featured this in a number of my videos. Now this is not a tutorial about this particular controller. I just happen to have this in my studio. But I want to talk generally about DAW controllers. I mean, if you've seen pictures of studios and you've wondered what these things are, you may mistake them for actual mixing boards. That's an honest mistake, and I'll talk about that in a second. Or perhaps you're considering a DAW controller for your studio and you really want to understand what they do. Well, that's what this video is all about. All right, so let's just jump in and get started and talk about DAW controllers. So what is a DAW controller? Well, a DAW controller looks like a mixing board, but it's not actually a mixing board. It's a controller for your DAW or your digital audio workstation. So pretty much all of the functions in your DAW are brought to the desktop to give you that hands-on control. It's just like a very complicated mouse. Now, if you look at this mouse here, you know, I've got a scroll wheel on the top and I've actually got one here for my thumb. You got a couple buttons over here, the scroll wheel button, the scroll could actually be pushed itself. And so every one of these buttons has an instruction that tells the computer to do something. And that's exactly what this does. It communicates uh, with your software and brings a lot of those functions to the desktop, like I said, to give yourself that hands-on control. But how does it communicate with the DAW? Now, this is something important to understand because that's going to help you manage your expectations, which is something I'm going to talk about in a second. So there's a protocol or a language that's been established that allows third-party devices to communicate with your recording and mixing software. And uh, that was put in place a long time ago as developers were developing different functionality. Uh, for those that gotten early and developed sort of a platform, think about your plugins, for example. There's so many third-party plugin developers that create plugins that work with your software. Now, now, how does that actually work? Well, there's actually a, a language, so to speak, or a protocol that's been developed uh, by software developers that have been absorbed by the different uh, developers of all the different DAWs. I mean, all of, you know, Ableton Live, you've got Pro Tools, you've got Logic Pro, you've got Reason, you've got Cubase. Now, those are all independent developers who've developed their recording and mixing software, but many of them have adopted certain protocols that are kind of universal. It's like a handshake between different devices. Let's face it, if there was just too many of these protocols, it would be harder for third-party developers and manufacturers to create peripherals and software that works uh, within the DAWs. It's like an ecosystem, you know, it's got to feed itself. And if you make it too complicated to get in, you're going to have less people using it. So there's a number of established established protocols in place that allows third-party developers to create products to work with your DAW. Now, Mackie, who makes some pretty good DAW controllers and been in the game for a long time, they established a protocol known effectively as the Mackie protocol. And that's generally included in virtually every DAW. It's an accepted standard. Uh, if you're using Pro Tools, uh, there's what's known as Huey. Same kind of thing. It's a certain protocol, a list of instructions that are built into the software that allows it to accept uh, third-party devices. Avid, which makes Pro Tools, they also make their own hardware. So there's obviously a tight-knit relationship between their controllers and their software. Same for Presonus, where they've got Studio One and they do make their own DAW controller. So again, very tight knit relationship. So as they're developing their software, they work with their hardware team and the, and the two talk uh, very well together. For everyone else, for that make what's called universal DAW controllers or control surface uh, as they're also known as. These are universal devices designed to work with all different DAWs. And uh, if you have a DAW that doesn't have uh, a related piece of hardware, or perhaps you have Studio One and you don't like their fader port or you wanna use something else, uh, you can venture out into the open world of universal controllers because of these protocols that will allow the unit to communicate with your software. 
But the reason I mention that is that I want to manage your expectations because I know uh, I field a lot of questions and comments here on my channel because I've done reviews on, on the G2 and the extender and it's been featured in, in a number of my videos. So I do get a lot of questions and I have influenced a few people to go out and buy one. And now if it's just not working, it's just not working. But uh, generally that's not the case. But occasionally I'll get messages with people said that this function doesn't work or that function doesn't work and they get frustrated. And they want to blame the dock controller. Uh, the reason I mentioned the protocol is because that language or that relationship between the two is really difficult because they need to talk to each other. The developers, the manufacturers of the dock controller need to communicate with the people making the software. And some of the software companies are more open to accepting more and more peripherals while others are a little bit more, uh, uh, let's say, not so open. We'll think about Apple as an example. So uh, sometimes when you're using a universal device, there's going to be certain functions that just might not work the way you expect them to work. Now, one thing that should never be a problem is the basic functions of mixing, panning, select, muting, solo record, your transport controls, jog shuttle, out of the box, unless there's something very wrong with that unit, uh, that's going to work without uh, any problems. But there's a lot of deeper functionality built into the controller. And that's where I think a lot of people sort of get kind of hung up. And I want to put that into perspective. Now, imagine you're working in a studio. Now, if you're on an SSL console, what are you going to have on board? Well, of course, you're going to be able to use the faders. And there's a built-in dynamic section. So you've got compression, you've got EQ, your trim. And but if you're starting to go to your effects and your reverbs and you know your outboard gear, well, what are you doing? You're reaching behind you to to adjust uh, all of the different effect units and and modules that you have uh, in your racks. You're not controlling it with the mixing board itself. Now the dock controller is capable of uh, manipulating your plugins uh, and a lot of other different things. But now we're getting deeper and deeper into functionality. And again, think about those handshakes. Plugins are a big one. For example. There's so many different plugin manufacturers or developers. How on earth is this DAW controller going to be efficient in controlling every single plugin on the market? Uh, as an example, uh, when the Sheps Omni Channel from Waves came out a couple years ago, uh, I picked it up and I was playing around with my controller and I went into the plugin section. And yes, it can control it, but there was something like 60 or 70 pages of parameters because you know, we have a very simple screen here uh, on the unit. So just paging down, paging down, trying to find the function that I wanted to use. It was just next to impossible. And really, I think it was I expected too much of the dock controller itself. So in that case, you know what? I'm not afraid to pick up the mouse. And I think I've become a very efficient hybrid user where I'm using the mouse and I'm using uh, the dock controller sort of in tandem. So the one area where I really feel a dock controller shines, and it's the reason why I wanted to get one in the first place, and the thing I was alluding to in the opening, and what's missing in sort of the, the digital mixing world, it's having that hands-on control on the faders. Uh, we've become so conditioned to the mouse and your keyboard and your screen and we can't help but mixing with our eyes. What does mixing with your eyes means? It means you're looking at an interface all the time when you're setting levels. Um, I mean, your senses are in a little bit of overload because obviously when you're mixing, the most important sense is your ears, not your eyes. But when you're working in a digital environment and you're looking at a screen, you, you know, you're sliding, clicking buttons on the screen. There's a lot of visual feedback uh, with a lot of things that we do in the DAW. We can't help but be influenced by what we're seeing on the screen. And really, being a good mixer comes down to these. You know, what you're hearing and the decisions that you're making to translate into something that appeals to you here. So the nice thing with the DAW controller, and I think the, the most important feature, uh, it's obvious. It's the ability to put your hands on the mix. You know, once you've got everything set up, you could literally turn off your screen. Let's say you're setting up your mix for the first time, so you've got all your tracks in place, you know, you've organized them, and now you want to just start roughing some levels in before you get into adding plugins and things like that you could just literally turn off the monitor and you can kick back and just start working through your project here. Um, I'm gonna show you a more practical example in a second, but you know whether you've got you know an eight channel controller here or you've added an extender, I've seen people you know have 32 uh, tracks because you can keep adding extenders. Uh, I think 32 tracks is the maximum with this setup here. Um, you can turn off your monitor and you can just listen. And even deeper and deeper into the mix as you're getting into different functions, even with your plugins, you know, once you set it up on the screen, you can sort of kick back, you can close your eyes, turn off the monitor and just listen. And I think that's the most amazing part of having a DAW controller and something that I really believe and feel is missing in the home studio experience, you know, many aspiring mix engineers and producers is just not having the mixing board there. These are not that expensive. You know, if you've made some investments and you're in the game and you're building up your studio, at some point, I think it's a great tool to have because I think it creates a bit of separation between you and your computer and just 
tighten that relationship between you and your music. And I think that's the greatest feature and the greatest thing that a DAW controller offers is that it really brings back that sort of organic mixing process that I think is a bit lacking with in-the-box mixing. This has nothing to do with sound. This has nothing to do with digital versus analog. It's a process. I think mixing is a relationship between your ears and your fingers and making something sounds great. And staring at a screen, sometimes we sort of get sucked into the interfaces and the feedback that we're getting visually that we sometimes forget to use what's most important and that's our ears. Anyways, that's just my opinion, but I think that's the number one reason why I would consider getting a DAW controller. So now I wanna take you through just a really simple uh, session, uh, just to walk you through how a DAW controller works. If you've never used one before, I'm just giving you an idea of the, the lay of the land here and uh, how this communicates uh, with the mix. All right, gonna take a look at a little basic session here. I'm not gonna give you a full uh, mix view here. Uh, we're not gonna sit through a whole session, I mean, but I just wanna give you sort of a basic understanding if you haven't used a DAW controller before, just to give you a little experience of what it's like. So the thing that I love most about having a DAW controller is that I've got all my tracks in front of me. Now, in my case, I have 16 tracks here, plus I have a dedicated master fader. These are uh, motorized faders. Now, if you notice, when I'm touching the faders here, these are touch sensitive. Uh, the tracks in my DAW respond accordingly. This is a great way to find your way around your project. Uh, if I click something in my track, for example, click on uh, the kick drum, it automatically locates uh, the track here on my DAW controller and vice versa. So if I was sitting here and wanted to know where I was in my mix, I'd just touch my fader and it highlights there in my project. So it's a really great way to navigate and, and know where you are. And uh, this is sort of this hybrid method that uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I know some people when they get a DAW controller, they just want to sit here and go to town like a, like a typewriter and never look at their keyboard or their mouse. It's just not possible. It's another tool to use, and if you utilize them all together, you can create a very, very efficient workflow. So uh, what I wanna sort of look at, just some of the basics here. Uh, when you're setting up a mix for the first time, I think that's really where a DAW controller shines. I mean, I know there's a process, you'll go through your gain staging, getting your gain all right. Let's assume uh, we've gone through some of that already, but we wanna just start to sort of rough together a very rough mix. We've got no plugins, uh, nothing, no effects whatsoever. Just gonna start getting the basic uh, levels in check. So uh, we've got full transport controls on the dock controller. So you've got play, stop, record. You can set your loops and uh, the functionals are here. That's a deeper dive, which I can just touch on a little bit later. Uh, but just as a, as a little start here, let's go on here. Um, I'm gonna click on the first track uh, in my mix here. That's gonna activate the first active track here. Uh, I have an empty track for some reason here on the first track. We won't worry about that. Um, but simply I can just, start bringing up my tracks. And the beauty of being able to work with two hands, that's something that you can't do with a mouse. So you can cycle through and you can solo your tracks. You can do multiple ones at once. So right away, really, that's really the big first benefit is having the ability to manipulate multiple tracks at once. You're basically only limited by the number of tracks your machine has and uh, uh, the fingers on your hands. Now, let's say I, I've got a little bit lost. I want to bring up the bass. I mean, I do. I can see it here on my display, uh, but uh, looking at your screen, if you want to efficiently find different tracks, I can just look for the bass here. And if I click on it, I can see it highlights here on my dock controller. There's the bass. I'm gonna solo it. I'm gonna mute it. So you have all the basic functions of a mixer here, just keeping in mind that none of the sound is actually passing through uh, the, dot, the dot controller itself. It's all going through the computer, through your interface. Uh, this is just controlling in essence, the parameters of, of everything that you're trying to do. So uh, the other thing too, by the way, if you've got tracks with as little as eight tracks, or projects with as little as eight tracks, 200 tracks, it doesn't matter. The dock controller can follow along with your projects. Uh, and this is where, if you think about a big studio where you've got like 48 tracks in front of you and you're wheeling around on your chair to get from one end to the other, you're kind of doing that, but the opposite. The console is wheeling around for you. You can sit in one place and you can actually bank. So uh, I don't know how many tracks I have in this project. I'll take a look here. Uh, there's about 38 different tracks here. Uh, I can use the bank buttons. I can go in groups of eight or I can go by individual tracks. If I was all day one end and I just want to move 
So it's just moving me along uh, one track at a time. But in this case, if you're using one controller, let's say you th think of groups of eight, you can be working on eight tracks. Let's say you're working on your drums, then you can bank over to the next eight, work on those. If you want to get to your submixes, whatever, you can just quickly whip over to the end. You can work on those. You can come all the way back. Uh, this particular one has a dedicated ma master fader that's not mappable. That's your master. Uh, it's there for you anytime you need it. Another thing I'm going to look at here, let's look at some pan controls. So I'm going to take a look at the, let's go to the section where the guitars are here. Let's play this. So I've got two pairs of guitars here. So let's start with this first pair, and I can pan them over to the left. Let's bring up the second pair. Pan those all the way to the right. on one side, pair on the other side. So you can easily set up your pants here with the pan controls. I've got another one here, let's put it up the middle. And then this third guitar comes in. Uh, so what I want to do, I'm going to pan that also to the right. And then when, I want to, I just want to test different mixing strategies. So This third one comes in, I'll drop the right side. So you very quickly test different ideas uh, with your hands right on the mix, and that's a really cool thing to have in your studio. If you were doing that in your DAW, um, again, you've got uh, one track at a time. Maybe you can shift click a few different ones, but uh, here you can get your hands right in there and dive in what you need to do, uh, play around with different uh, ideas and stuff, and it's really, really super quick. So another great feature of a, a DAW controller is the ability to write automation. Um, I mean, you can do it with your mouse and you can plot points or you can drag the fader in your DAW. But uh, here, having a, a, an actual live fader here, you can ride a track in real time and really write some really cool, and I would say more accurate uh, automation. So what I've got here, I've got a guitar solo. What I'm gonna do in real time, I'm gonna ride the fader and create some nice automation, some volume swells uh, to create some uh, interesting effects for, uh, for the guitar solo. So what I do is I can select the track uh, that's activating uh, the assignment section here uh, on the QCon Pro. Uh, different dock controls will call it different things, but the additional functions will now be related to the active track. Uh, I can uh, change my write mode. Uh, I'm going to put on latch. So now this track is now live. If I roll, if I ride this fader, uh, it's going to change uh, the volume of that track uh, respective to the movements of the fader. So let's do this in real time and see what we get. And now we can play back the results of uh, my automation. So that just gives you a really, really rough example of what you can do uh, in writing automation. That's a really great feature of a DAW controller as well, and I absolutely love doing that. Uh, if you're writing a vocal, for example, I mean, the moves don't have to be that drastic, but really subtle moves. You could be writing your fader. If you know your track well, you know the performance well, you can just do the nice writing with the fader, get that vocal track just right, and uh, you can go back and, of course, uh, tweak it later. So all of the basic functions are right at your fingertips. If you want to dive deeper and deeper, I mean, there's a lot of layers and pages to the functions that a DAW controller can actually manipulate. And from there, it really depends on how much you want to dive in and sort of learn those functions. And perhaps you want to customize them and map them uh, to yourself. Uh, some of you out there are tweakers and, you and you're you very specific about uh, your layouts and where you want everything. So you definitely can do that. But uh, ultimately, uh, having your hands on the DAW controller is a really great experience. If you're mixing with a mouse and you're mixing just with 
with your eyes, you know, you can make some great music. I'm not saying you can't, but it's something to be said about getting your hands on the mix. It's a completely different feeling. You can just kind of kick back. You can ride your faders, work your way through the projects and uh, really bring back that old style mixing to what's really in the box mixing. Well, there you have my insight into DAW controllers. I certainly hope you found that informative. Uh, if you have any further questions, things I didn't cover, please just drop it into the comments and I'll do my best to get to them. Uh, if you're new to the channel, I hope I've earned a subscribe. I have a lot of videos on this channel revolving around this home studio, uh, geared to the home studio enthusiasts just like you and me. So uh, perhaps you'll just hit that subscribe button and come along for the ride. If you really want to support this channel, I am on Patreon. Links to everything I've discussed and some things that I haven't are in the description below. And above all else, I hope I'll see you again in another video. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And please like, subscribe, and ring that bell to stay up to date. Remember, you don't need a band to rock and roll. There are a lot of great musical projects you can do by yourself, right from your own home. I hope to see you again next time.